BBC News and this is our daily updates on COVID-19 where we bring you all the latest stories and the latest events and happenings around the country, around Africa and around the globe uh, in respect of COVID-19. Uh, as usual, I have been joined in the studio by my two colleagues, uh, Edward Nyakon. Edward Nyakon is head of the business desk here at GBC News. Silikem Akolache Apalu is uh, a journalist, but she's also the host of Women's Voice here on GBC News. This afternoon, uh, we are going to focus, um, this morning going into uh, later in the afternoon, we will focus on a variety of issues uh, related to COVID-19. We are looking at the COVID-19 and its impact on ECOWAS economy. Uh, later, we shall be speaking to Dr. Kofi Kunedu Apraku. Dr. Apraku is the commissioner uh, in charge of macroeconomic policy at ECOWAS. We shall also uh, talk about that day of national prayer and fasting uh, which uh, members of the christian community are organizing uh, to pray for and against uh, COVID-19 and its spread. Uh, we shall spend some time talking to Reverend Dr. Paul Boafo, who is the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church. And then we'll also speak to Professor Dr. Frimpon Manso from the Assemblies of God. But um, uh, throughout the week, we have been bringing you reports as to how after the lifting of the lockdown, some category of Ghanaians are not respecting the social distancing protocols and all the other uh, protocols uh, in respect of combating COVID-19. Fortunately, we will be joined in the studio by Mr. Osei Bonsu. Mr. Osei Bonsu is the Director of Media and Communications Operations uh, at the COVID-19 team. Uh, we shall speak to him later this morning. But we'll take a trip to Kenya where within the week we told you about uh, happenings in Kenya where uh, uh, aside COVID-19 they had to deal with the invasion of locusts. Now we are hearing that Kenya has been hit by an attack from bees. How bad can it get? We shall speak to our uh, contact in Kenya to find out the situation there. Uh, so let's start uh, here this morning. Um, again, uh, have the figures changed? Uh, let's, yesterday there was a press conference. We always look up to the press conference for the figures. But again, uh, we also know that the ministry's website keeps updating uh, exactly. Ghanaians. So what, what are the latest figures? Right. We have um, the figures remain the same as they have been in the last three days. The figures stand at 1,154 uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19, 120 recoveries, four who are critical, nine who are dead. 82% of those uh, people who have confirmed uh, cases have uh, no female, 60% of the number are male. So far, 86,000 contacts have been traced, and we've done about 68,000 tests as well. Uh, Bishop, talking about 82% uh, uh, of uh, the cases being locally uh, uh, transmitted, um, you, you have been very excited uh, about the fact that Ghanaians have been innovative enough. We have the basins, we have, and now we have Ghanaians putting together face masks and so on. But there's a flip side to that uh, as well, that as Ghanaians uh, prepare and manufacture their own face masks and sell in traffic, you find people in traffic, they take the face masks, try it on, if it's not good enough, they give it back, <laughs> take another one, and then the argument is that that could be another source of transmission of the virus. Exactly. They in attempt to make business or do business and also to do help in the fight against this pandemic. They are conscious, the consciousness of the average trader out there about the need to stick to the protocols uh, it's not been observed because ideally you don't have to use your bare hands to take it off and even put it on because you are told we need to even try to touch our faces so it's it's very uh, something that we need to look at and it's called cause for education so some video clip you know videos are very powerful could be on the social media mainstream platform to educate them about this uh, phenomenon all right. And uh, fortunately, we have been joined uh, on the line by Dr. Kofi Kunedu Apreku. Dr. Apreku is the commissioner in charge of macroeconomic policy at ECOWAS. Uh, Doc, thank you very much for joining us here on GBC News. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to join you today. Doc Doc, it's been a while since we saw you on TV, and uh, I'm excited that uh, you look very healthy as well. 
Thank you. We all have been locked down. You in Ghana, I'm here in Abuja for the last two months. We've been in a lockdown period. We are hoping that there will be some good news like we have had in Ghana on Monday mm. so that we can have the freedom to move around and, and continue with all the, that we've been doing. Doc, you are in charge of macroeconomic policy at ECOWAS. Um, now we understand that the ECOWAS countries have been hit, economies have been hit greatly by uh, the COVID-19. Indeed, here in Ghana, when President Ekufado delivered one of his addresses to the nation, he did indicate that uh, we know how to bring the economy back to life, but we do not know how to bring the dead back to life. It is clear that West African economies are struggling. You are in charge of macroeconomic uh, policy. Uh, do we have a way of bringing these economies back to life after COVID-19? We don't have a choice. Um, maybe before we get there, we have to look at the magnitude of the challenge that we have. So it will help us to understand and to perhaps make, make, make more realistic appraisals of the situation and the prospects of getting it back. But obviously, we don't have a choice. We have to bring it back to normality. We have tremendous challenges. The projections are very serious on us, all aspects, on the economy, on business, on the social sector, tremendous amount of challenges. Ordinary, you know, we all have some difficulties in our respective countries, but this being compounded, the magnitude of it is overwhelming and is incomprehensible. So, yes, it's a day-to-day -day affair. We have to come back at one step at a time. Look, we, we know that um, oil, oil prices have dropped. And African countries, notably Nigeria, where you are based right now, depends largely on oil. Ghana, to a large extent, our budget has uh, depended on uh, the proceeds from the oil industry as well, oil and gas industry. But in recent times, oil prices have dropped, and indeed, that sector is beginning to, to scramble under the pressure of COVID-19. Uh, tell me how bad the situation is within the sub-region. Let me state uh, a statement that supports exactly what you have said. We have seen over 60%. Yesterday, the fall in oil prices, we have brought it to 100% almost. It's in the negative. The features, oil features are in the negative in terms of pricing. So Nigeria, Ghana are the largest source of oil in our sub-region. Nigeria's revenue is estimated to go down over 60 it's about two weeks ago, but this thing is changing every day. And Ghana equal, we're going to lose tremendous amount of oil resources that otherwise would have come into our country for use in government expenditures. But it's not only limited to oil. Cocoa, cotton, they have experienced significant declines. And as I will show you um, in a few minutes, is overall everything that we do export gold cocoa gold is a little solid but cocoa coffee cotton and all the other all iron oil that we export the magnitude of the products that we export from west africa experience significant declines in prices some over 60 70 and therefore the impact on revenues is very significant let me take a minute to tell you other areas that we are also suffering revenue losses. Mm. Tremendous mm. amount of revenues are generated through remittances. And if you have time, I give you all the statistics that we get in the COAS every year. Remittances are a major source of revenue for Ghana, Nigeria, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, Cape Verde, and some of them derive 30, 40 percent of their revenues from remittances. It's going to suffer significantly because most of our people working overseas and sending their monies are in very precarious economic situation and will now have the resources. You recall recently they said America, um, the American economy has suffered over what twenty percent unemployment as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Mostly, it will be those that have got foreign affairs to go. So there is tremendous amount of losses that we expect from remittances. Beyond that, tremendous amount of resource losses come from um, 
our other areas such as tourism, airlines that we shut down, uh, hotel accommodation that otherwise would have been utilized, but tourist, we have calculated all of this. When we put all the revenue losses together, we have 72.4 billion dollars that we are going to lose in our respective economies this year, 2020. Uh, when we have adjusted for revenues that we will get, obviously government revenue sources are available, but almost all undermined. So the net, what we call the spending gap, the difference between revenues that we have and expenditures governments have to undertake in overall for the economy of uh, West Africa, we have a short gap of 72.4 billion. Mm. That will not be available for us to do otherwise our normal activities that we do. We're not talking about new projects. We're talking about where we left, left off before the COVID-19. Mm. So that is very serious. It is the essence of this that we organize because all the sectors uh, we look at have suffered revenue losses and therefore is overwhelming. You look at growth. Last year, ECOWAS projected that the economy, the regional economy, will grow at a rate of 3.3 percent. As the goods and services that are produced within the region over the period of one year will go up 3.3 percent. Yes, now, after COVID, we did, our, we did our first assessment and we thought we still can maintain about 1.4 percent of the growth. IMF has just issued a steady state figures that suggest that we will go down, we will even stabilize. Rate of growth will be minus 1.43%. It wipes up all the growth from last year and dips deeper. So we have very serious challenges ahead of us. Mm. Uh, but doc again um uh, on the flip side you've talked about loss of revenue you've talked about the remittances that are no longer coming but um a couple of months ago maybe two months ago uh one of the positives that uh people took away from the COVID 19 so to speak was the fact that various currencies within the sub uh, region had begun to appreciate and become stronger in respect of or in uh, relative to the dollar and so on so in ghana when the cd had depreciated so much to about 5.9 against the dollar all of a sudden the cd began to gain some strength against the dollar and now the cd stands at about 5.4 5.5 against the dollar that is some positive isn't it oh no 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 mm. no 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 it's very short term look at what where do we get our revenues from we sell goods and services of the seas and generate revenues, uh, uh, foreign revenues. Our exports are being killed. It's a temporary phenomenon. I don't know where those figures come from, but I tell you here in Nigeria, the, the Naira is depreciated so significantly. And if you talk about Ghana, the figures that I have suggest that the city is going to depreciate more and more. Our foreign external reserves are under siege. You have to be able to maintain the value of your currency based on your reserves. Reserves are being utilized by governments now to stay alive. So we're going to draw down our foreign exchange reserves. And when you don't have adequate foreign exchange reserves, the end product is that your currency becomes weak. There's no doubt about that fact. So maybe it's a temporary phenomenon that I'm not sure. But I agree that the rate of exchange between the dollar and the CD last time I was there compared to now, it's a significant depreciation. Mm. And it would have violated any, any, any all economic uh, laws. It's not possible that we're going to experience any a significant depreciation. There's no basis at all. And, uh, appreciation, sorry, we're going to experience significant appreciation of our currency. The reverse is what is true. In Europe and in North America, a lot of the citizens are beginning to file for unemployment benefits. Uh, the numbers keep increasing every other day. Here in Africa, in the sub-region, uh, most of the countries do not have unemployment benefits and policies like that. Now, uh, persons who even are under employment, who are in employment, uh, Doc, uh, 
the, the situation is such that many people have been asked to stay home whilst the numbers that are at work have been limited. Now it's beginning to show that some production can take place without certain groups of people. And the fear is that these groups of people, after COVID-19, may become unemployed by themselves. So the unemployment situation is likely to be very bad in Africa and in West Africa in particular. You are in charge of macroeconomic policy. What can be done to ensure that we do not get to a point where unemployment becomes another source of insecurity for the people? Very, very important point that you have stressed. Indeed, it is the case that we're going to experience tremendous amount of unemployment within our sub-region. And we, in ECOWAS, have made several recommendations to the heads of states. We believe that we should be very, very uh, critical in assessing the actions that we take in order to stop this COVID and its spread. If we are not careful, we will throw the child with the, uh, uh, the water out. We have to be able to look at the sectors that need support and the apply and the indicator. The small and medium scale industries need in significant support and it can be given to them through various avenues that we have made recommendation to uh, government. And indeed in Ghana, you recall Ghana has set up some fund to support, I think if I'm correct, and I may not be correct, mm -hmm. A, a, about 600 billion CDs that have been allocated to support small scale in small and medium scale industries. That's appropriate. That's part of his recommendation that we have made. We have to be able to sustain the agricultural sector. It cannot be the case that this lockdown ties activity in the agricultural sector in the rural areas. This is the time we need to energize those sectors till they can produce. We have to be able to also mobilize international support to provide avenues for their contributivities. The Central Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of Finance were in a meeting here in ECOWAS, and the recommendation to them was that they should support commercial banks in particular through all kinds of incentives so that they can increase their loan portfolio and availability of funds small-scale industries, particularly those that are affected in rural areas where it will be easier for them to go back to work. There's no doubt that we will have to work harder than we have just to stay alive, not even making progress, just to stay where we were in 2019. Look, um, ECHO has had plans of introducing the ECHO this year. Uh, we are in April, uh, very soon May will be upon us, and uh, we do not know exactly when COVID-19 is going to go away. What becomes of the destiny of ECHO? I think um, before I can be so specific, let me state that all the available indications to us now, and it's very difficult to say this, but it's the truth. There is no indication that suggests that perhaps even one of the six convergence criteria may be met this year. Mm -hmm. So among other recommendations that we made at the summit to the heads of states and to the ministers of finance and, and governors of the uh, central banks is to call a meeting of the convergence council to look at the situation. Not only is it that we are not going to be able to and meet the convergence criteria and therefore the single currency deadline. But also look at some of the limitations. There are a lot of restrictions that are imposed on government in terms of their spending. You know, we have limited expenditure that government must make every year. We have limited amount of uh, external reserves that must be maintained. And many, many, many more. So those are all limitations. It is under this circumstance necessary, I'm posing a question, for us to look at the convergence criteria and assess those that we can modify in the state of emergency for government to be able to engage in stimulus economic programs, particularly in support of private sector, the vulnerable, the poor, uh, the agricultural sector, small-scale sector, 
so that they can actually get back to produce and take us out of this major recession that we anticipate. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that we may not be able to meet the, uh, the currency debt plan. The issue is that there are limitations that are placed on governments in terms of spending, in terms of the maintenance of foreign reserves, external reserves, and so many other things that in that situation like this, government may have to be made more flexible. Do, Doc, they, yes, uh, please per permit me to ask you a more personal question. You know, the, the president has um, launched a, a fund, a COVID-19 fund. Uh, a lot of well-meaning Ghanaians have begun contributing to that fund. You are one of Ghana's most respected sons. Um, you've been a minister of state. You now head the macroeconomic policy unit at ECOWAS and so on. Are you planning of donating, contributing to this fund? Oh, my brother, I have already contributed to the fund. I made a contribution of 50,000 Ghana CDs, and it was presented on my behalf because I'm not there, didn't generate the publicity, perhaps that others, contrib other contributors have made. But I have made my own contribution, and that's the minimum. As a Ghanaian, I have a lot of responsibility. I've benefited from Ghana. Ghana made me who I am. It can never be the case that when my nation needs me and I can be there physically to help, uh, there is a, a key proverb that says, uh, mm. In other words, <laughs> if I cannot be there, my resources should be there to support. And therefore, I made a contribution of 50,000 Ghana cities for that course. Mm. Uh, 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 Doc, at this stage, we would like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, we'll certainly come back to you when uh, we find uh, other changes in the situation in the sub-region. Uh, we'll certainly get back to you for more analysis, uh, Dr. Abreku. Thank you very much. We've been speaking to Dr. Kofi Kunedo Abreku, who is the uh, commissioner in charge of macroeconomic policy at ECOWAS, and he has been telling us uh, about the ECOWAS situation and what um, uh, ECOWAS is doing to ensure that the economies of West African countries come back to life right after COVID-19 or even within uh, COVID-19, what the African countries are doing to ensure that the economies do not crumble. Um, uh, Edward, you uh, especially are very interested in these economic uh, issues. You talked about um, the, the, the debt relief for, for Africa, but for West Africa in, in particular, and I'm sure that's news that would excite you. Yeah, it's very important because um, the G20 a couple of weeks ago met and they, 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 made, they said that um, countries, the IDA, Canada's International Development Association's uh, member countries that are owing, and to, I mean, they are owing, they owe multilateral, bilateral, and commercial uh, entities, they should give them some debt relief. Uh, that is from May, 1st May. If those who are due to make repayment, they ought not to do it. They should be allowed some more pay mm. for some time. So that is very good because um, we need a debt relief because if, imagine Ghana was supposed to service its debt by 12 billion cities this year, which is about, let's say, back in 3.9 billion dollars for this year alone we don't have that money now at the moment mm. and so if we're supposed to be do, doing that then we're going to be strangled literally economically and we're not going to be on the breathing space to do that so pushing for debt relief is phenomenal and again he talked about the need to review the convergence criteria that is an inflation target mm. that your your import cover your international reserves and all those things uh, um we, as i said if you look at a sub region we've set this macroeconomic target but we'll not be able to meet it so you see one one in one year or two years this country will meet this criteria other countries are not able to meet it and as a result of that the every now and then we are changing we're shifting the goalposts but it's time for us to take a second look at that and one key thing he talked about was uh, i'm interested is that the need to ensure food security because in the midst of a lockdown a lot of people at home even those who are free to go out there, there are certain, you know, the value chain of supply, the supply value chain has been disrupted. And so it makes it difficult for people who are into farming to get the needed input to go. And so there's, there's a time for us to spend uh, massively because if you're not careful, we focus too much on COVID-19, you need to be, I mean, you have food because if you don't eat, you're not going to get a good uh, you know, nutrition. So. It's very uh, important you've made a comment about that. And then you also talked about the review the, uh, of the GDP growth rate in uh, West Africa that is going to be. 
But I just also listened to the IMF and they made it known that, yes, it seems that Africa seems to be suppressing um, the, 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 the pandemic. And so I wonder to, I couldn't get a chance. I want to find out, is that a good news for us? Mm -hmm. Because that's what the IMF just released from mm -hmm. their website, that uh, it seems we are flattening the curve quickly to their, I mean, the, the amazement. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to find out from him uh, what, what is going to help us in the midst of that. And again, they said that because if Africa keeps on this trajectory, there's a likelihood the appetite for investors in terms of uh, putting, where they, putting money, investing, will be in Africa. Mm. Because the other communities have been hard hit. So every much rational being will be expecting to spend in an economy that will get good returns. All right. And um, before I get to Silicon, uh, Bishop, once again, if uh, there was any point where we would realize the importance of the tourism industry, hmm. it is now. It is now. Uh, the airplanes are not flying, uh, the hotels are hmm. not getting the businesses, and it's having a toll on national economies. And Dr. Preku clearly mentioned that as well. It, it is true. It is massive. If I pass, I, I pass around the airport, that was a couple of weeks, days ago, and I was like, wow. This busy place has now become like a ghost town, a ghost city. It is sad because, you see, when the airlines are moving up and down like that, it means the aviation fuel, you buy it. And so that's going to help the oil industry to be in business. And we are told that, yesterday we had an interview, that the oil industry are going to lay off a lot of people because they're not going to embark on the massive investment projections they are planned. Mm. Because if they are planned to drill about four wells now, it's useless. He talked about the fact that the oil... So why do we export those... Mm. produce mm. to now. So it's time for us to begin to think about being part of the chain where we are involved in the finished good. Because now that we haven't invested in processing, we're going to be faced with a glut. So these are some of the issues that I think we should look at. All right, uh, we'll take a short break. Uh, this is a COVID-19 update here on GBC News. When we come back from the break, we will be joined by Mr. Osebonsu. Mr. Osebonsu is the driver. Stay with us here. This is GBC News. Thanks for staying. This is GBC News. This is our daily COVID-19 update. And we've just been joined by Mr. Uh, Ose Bonsu Dixon. He's a director, media and communications uh, with the Operation COVID-19 Safety Committee. Uh, but he's also chief legal advisor, National Security Council Secretariat. Uh, Mr. Dixon, thank you very much for joining us. We are grateful that you found time to join us, even though uh, these are very busy times for you, uh, 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 isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. I mean, moment, it is. Uh, it is. So tell me, what's the typical day in your life uh, right now like um, since uh, we started fighting against COVID-19? Okay, so it's taking a dramatic, a dramatic um, evolution. So first, you have a lot of meetings to do with how, at a policy level, at mm. a national level, we put a constraint on the pandemic. And that comes from the committee that you just mentioned, for which I'm the director for communication and media. And so early in the day, well, I start by looking at the various strategies that we have. I coordinate activities with the uh, director for public relations, the, for the, mil the military, for the um, intelligence uh, contributions that come, and then also for the police PR issues. Mm -hmm. And then also our own outfit, the National Security Council Secretariat. Bearing in mind that we are, um, how do you call it, um, the center field for all intelligence and all information purposes that are needed to address this particular uh, situation that we have on our hands. Tell me more about the committee, Operation COVID-19 Safety Committee. Okay. What, what, what's your mandate? So immediately after the Restrictions Act came in, the Act 10112, and the, the executive instruments 
um, were then being churned out, first one to the act. The president instructed the National Security Council Secretariat, or by large, the Ministry of National Security, to start putting into effect a committee at a national level that will have a handle on a number of things. Now, one was the initial phase of the National Quarantining Program, which we were supposed to take into cognizance. The second was to look at um, aspects about uh, tracing, contact tracing, um, testing, and then also treatment. Now, all these areas would require a large um, amount of security effort. If one were going to do quarantining, obviously it was going to be impossible to do without stationing uh, police, um, military, and other security elements as necessary. If one were going to do isolationism, it was also very necessary. If one was going to impose limitations within a certain geographical jurisdiction, it was necessary to look at the configuration in terms of the security architecture, the pitfalls, the strengths of it, the SWOT analysis, and so on and so forth. So it was quite a very broad sweep. And by and large, I mean, right from the, um, the time we started quarantining, we have been successful in actually getting the presidential orders into full effect. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you mm. have seen both the numbers of police, the numbers of military intelligence activities have all been rushed up. Now, this is also a kind of committee that brings about almost about 24 state agencies. So you talk about the Ghana Health Service, the Ministry of Health itself, Ministry of Communication, Ministry of Information, and so on and so forth. There are even private sector groups that are very useful in our engagement. For example, the Center for Strategic and Defense Studies that provides guidelines, helps us to develop these things, and so many other groups that have also come within the free. So it's quite a very broad mm. sweep. No, really, uh, but again, uh, before we even get to issues that have come up uh, after the partial lockdown was lifted, uh, our reports from Tamale in particular indicate that some Guineans who had come in and were suspected uh, to have come into contact with the virus were quarantined. As we speak, and because you come from the National Security Council Secretariat, I think that maybe you would be able to provide us with answers. These Guineans have threatened to break out and to leave because according to them, they have undergone the mandatory test, they've been tested and it's negative, and yet they're being uh, detained in the quarantine center in Tamale in particular. Okay, so that's a very good reference point. But I would prefer to say a few of the comments on it as decisions are being made mm. as to that. But the only thing I'd like to say is that we're a country of rules and laws, okay? And to that effect, I mean, those who enter our territories are subject to the laws that we make here. They're not subject to their own authorities or their own laws. So that is a subject matter that we must be very clear. So they're subject to our laws in this jurisdiction. Once you come under quarantine, mm. The operative rule is that a lot of your normal freedoms are suspended. That must be clarified. And so the, the, the issues of we are breaking or all those things, those things are unlawful. I mean, those are just unlawful outbursts. I mean. But one should understand that in the period pursuant to quarantining others or imposing restrictions on others, mm. there are a lot of socio-psychological issues that are pop up. So when you see people ventilating these things, they have to be handled in, a, in some kind of uh, manner. We understand that people would have um, effusions, people would actually, they would sweat under that type of pressure. But those are normal things that even with the security, um, how do you call it, um, uh, prime movers, put into our planning. We understand. Right. We put in psychologists, for example, for them. So Mr. Dixon, sorry, that... um, uh, 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 you are here with us in the studio. We'll, we'll have you for some time. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, there is uh, the plan to have a, th a three-day national prayer and fasting uh, uh, for, for the country. Fortunately, we've been joined by Reverend Dr. Paul Boafo, the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church, uh, to tell us w why this has become necessary at this point in time. Uh, Reverend Dr. Paul Bafo, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on GBC News. Reverend Bafo, uh, if you can hear me, my first question to you would be that uh, uh, critics of religion have said that this is not really the time for prayers. This is a time for scientific interventions. Why are you calling for prayers at this time? <laughs> Well, that's, that's a very interesting 
a statement to, to, to make that, uh, yes, we, we know that the human being is both physical and spiritual. And that is why we believe that as the scientists work, the spiritual aspect should also come in. And the, the, the two go hand in hand. And we also believe that even from the spiritual realm, all those scientists are aided by God, the God who is paramount when it comes to our spirituality. And can we say at this point, Reverend, uh, that God perhaps don't know about COVID-19 before it hits the world? If he knew and he so loved his children, why did it? Why did he allow this COVID-19 to hit his children? And why are we now going back to him for help? Yes, uh, we, we live in a world which has also been plagued by human uh, activity and human sinfulness. This is a world in which you find God being rejected. God being pushed aside. And we are not angels. We are not living in, in heaven where you don't find these challenges. Because this world is full of all these uh, challenges, that is why we believe that God is still in control. But being in control doesn't mean that he takes everything away as we would want to think. And we need to go back to him because he has all the world in his hands. Uh, uh, forgive me if I'm being a pessimist here, but again, no, no, that's okay. uh, but, but, uh, again, still back to my initial question. If God, who is deemed as being omniscient, knows it all, omnipresent there at all times, and omnipotent has the power to do everything at any time he wishes. Why did he look on for this virus to hit the world the way it has hit the world and to devastate the world in a way that none of the world wars has ever hit the world like? This is very devastating. God watched on for all this to happen? Yes, it's, it's very devastating. Very, very true. And this is, as I said earlier, we, this is also a sinful world. And there are other uh, spirits that are also in control, but they do not have power over God. And this is why it has become very, very necessary to go to him who has power over all these uh, demons, all these other uh, spirits that also seem to be controlling our world. There are those who say that we have already prayed to God. Indeed, in the first week of the COVID-19 coming to Ghana, the president uh, requested that the nation had a, a, a one-day prayer and fasting, you know, national day of prayer and fasting, which we all did. And yet, God yeah. did not listen to the prayer. Why now? Why would he listen now if he listened not to us in the past? Yes. The, the Bible tells us that pray without ceasing. In prayer, we don't come to an end. We don't tell ourselves that, oh, we have prayed and that is all. Just as every day we go through our routine, in the same vein, we believe that this God we must go to him at all times. We cannot relegate him to the background in our search for solution, in our search for healing, in our search for a panacea. And so he is to play a part. That's why we need to go to him. And again, the Bible also tells us that even as we come to him, we should not forget that he, we have to knock and knock and knock until the door is opened. And so even though we were called to prayer on 25th of March, we believe that we have to come back to him. And between that interval, that is from 25th to today, we have also been praying. We, have, we, we never stopped praying. 
just as we never stop going to whatever we have our daily work, the same vein we need to come to him again, this time with fasting and asking him yes. to Reverend, heal. Reverend Doctor, very, very finally, uh, and so this uh, three-day national prayer and fasting, how is it going to be organized? Who and who should take part? All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, this is a virtual uh, prayer session we are organizing because of the social distancing that is in place. And what we are saying is that wherever you find yourself as a Christian, during the mornings, we have prayer bulletins. So people have to join in in praying. Then in the afternoon, we are also praying for repentance. In fact, the early morning is prayer of thanksgiving. Then the afternoon is prayer of repentance. Then evening is our supplications where we come to God asking for his power, his healing, his hand, and his voice to heal our land. And everyone who is a Christian in Ghana, organized by all the Christian bodies, the Christian Council, the Ghana Pentecostal Council, the Ghana National Association of Charismatic Churches, the Ghana Catholic Bishops Conference, and the para churches, that is the SU, Full Gospel, Aglo, uh, Gako, and all of them. We are all part of it, and we pray that each and every one in your closet, you can pray. In your office, you can pray. On the farm, on the office, in the vehicle, wherever you find yourself, let us all commit to prayer and call on God. Yes, the sovereign God, the God who heals, yes. the faithful God. Reverend, thank you. Thank you very much. At the end of the three days, we shall certainly get back to you to find out how it went, and whether or not we should expect results from uh, the prayers. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, Reverend Doctor. Thank you too, and God bless you. Thank you, God sir. Bless you. Uh, Reverend Doctor Paul Boaf is the presiding bishop of Methodist Church, and he has been talking to us about the three-day national prayer and fasting. L later on, we shall also speak to Professor Doctor Frimpong Manso of the <laughs> Assemblies of God. But we have in the studio um, the communications. Uh, the director media and communications of uh, operation COVID safety committee he's also chief legal advisor national security council secretariat uh, mr osei bonsu dixon um so yeah, be, before we spoke to reverend doctor mm -hmm. i wanted to find out and i'm here with selikem who will be helping me with some of the questions <laughs> as well um so COVID safety and we saw that um, in order to take care of the very poor and vulnerable in society during the lockdown period, uh, people went out to give food, sometimes even government agencies, and I believe including yours as well. But we saw videos and pictures. In fact, we took some of, us, of us, uh, ourselves where people were jammed and crammed together just because they were racing for food. And that, for some of us, exposed them even further. That was no safety. You saw these? Yeah, you are with absolutely. the committee. You should have been concerned. Yeah, we're concerned. And, and before I express my own concern or maybe voice something over it, let me, um, Reverend Boafo's mm. statement. I think that you, you must take it in, very, in its fullness and in its, in, 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 its, in its entirety that we need sometimes spiritual stamina for our physical work. We need that enablement. I mean, I, I totally agree that this country, in this moment of doubt and difficulty, should be looking at every resource that we have physical, mental, intellectual, spiritual. Now back to the issues about the, um, the distribution of the food. Yes, I think that in the early days of the distribution, yes, there were challenges. We saw them clearly and we're deeply concerned about them. And at that time, to how do you call it, um, uh, a number of things were coming to the fore. We've had disasters in this country, but we haven't had a disaster that has an infectivity or an infectious capacity or rate as this. And so if in the past, for example, these are some of the things that go on and there's been replicated now. I mean, it's, it's enhanced more because of the visuals, the TVs, and apart from that too, because of the times that we live in, it's the first time that we're imposing social distancing as a national clarion call. And so deeply, we were quite affected by it. 
And, but we did not take, how do you call it, a certain back. Uh, quickly, the committee got together with other committees to immediately look at guidelines that would, um, how do you call it, address the, uh, the looming problems that we are going to be having. So I can say that uh, um, it, it, we rather acted with a bit of dispatch when we saw it. NADMO was a lead agency to give that. They have a lot of experience with this. But like I said, you could see in a situation where the hungry are so many, the difficulties that they had with imposing the SOPs that have been given them became very, very so clear. I mean, I was amazed, for example, when I saw videos coming even across our shores from Nigeria. Some of the pictures that I saw actually flamoxed me. I was quite shaken by them. But it's not something that, how do you call it, we need to take lightly. Because the Clarion Call is social distancing protocols. We have to enforce them necessary. And if, um, how do you call it, people will not obey them, the food aid must be withdrawn, period. Mm -hmm. So those aspects were now being put into effect. And I think that, how do you call it, now the seeds that have been sown for social distancing, for example, are, 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 are becoming much more deeper. Talking about social distancing and deepening uh, those protocols, for instance, since the lockdown was lifted by the president after his seventh address, people seem to have gone back to business as usual. Are there any plans of enforcing social distancing in a way that it will actually be applied? Yeah, so it is, it is in nature, it, 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 is, it, it, it is something that we expected. We knew that, how do you call it, um, the people in the initial phases um, were going to behave in a manner that would require further one education. My purpose being here is to increase the Ghanaian education or the national education about what is going on and what we must do going forward. So the, in sociological or s terms, we knew that the society would initially, having been under a clenched hard lockdown or partial lockdown, once it was lifted, there will be a search for, I need this, I want this, people moving around to, you know, they don't know whether the lockdown will be reversed, assuming there is some kind of maybe new information. So that we expected. And then quickly, we also expected new rules to quickly be rolled in. For example, the rules that you have seen, the metropolitan authorities. Okay, and so just, just sorry to budge in here. Uh, we, we're showing on the screen one of the markets in Accra where uh, the people themselves decided to do social distancing. And so you can see uh, from this picture the distance between one stall to the other. These are makeshift uh, stalls, but the people really understand the need to keep those distances. Uh, and, and, and then we have this one too here. Uh, Yes, so yes, uh, you can continue making the point, but uh, what I'm saying is that the people themselves do not even need any authority to come and tell them, stay apart because it is for your own good. Yes, so, sir. So, so I think they do need. I mean, the point is that mm. it's a, the, the public education is a corollary, corollary to, how do you call it, the enforcement or the compliance mechanisms that are going on. Right. Now, the first one that you showed, I don't know whether you can roll it back. Mm. Yeah, let's go back uh, so the to, the, to the very first picture. Uh, my director will do that shortly. Okay. Yes, so that's the it. first one that you showed, this is a cinema market. Mm -hmm. And a cinema market is in the eastern region. It says around, um, uh, around um, not too far from main town. Kofodia. Yeah, and mm -hmm. um, the, what's the name? The Insawem area, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but then that's, you're right when you say that. Um, the market, for example, is resolving itself in the manner in which we're talking about. Mm. But this was not automatic. Mm. This was the state and the agencies. And thank you, the assemblies working to ensure that these distancing protocols were oh, going to be put right. into effect. Mm, mm. The second one that uh, you showed. Yes, yeah, so we'll bring that up shortly. That one, I think, yes. is not Ghana. That, the second one. The second picture, this yes, one. Yes. We've seen this picture, mm -hmm. and our forensics indicate that this is uh, Myanmar or something. Mm -hmm. We're yet to authenticate um, it's that, that, that accuracy. But mm. if it is so, these are given as. Um, 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 how do you call it? It's showing that it is possible. It's something we can do. We must adapt to new cultural behaviors immediately. Society is dynamic. And I think that, how do you call it, when you're faced with danger, grave danger, mm. you must resolve yourself quickly. You have no time to say, how do you call it, uh, um, to look at uh, things that you can do. You must look at the possibilities and things that you can do. And in Greater Accra, in Western Region, and in Ashanti, I can assure you that the assemblies are actually, um, um, how do you call it, in full force enforcing these distancing, the two meter social distancing requirement. What yeah. about the wearing of the masks? Are there going to be mandatory uh, 
enforcement of the wearing of masks and what's the plan? Okay, so that's a good point. The wearing of the mask, as you have seen from a press release that was issued from the coordinating councils, mm. indicates that this is going to be mandatory. It is going to be mandatory in the sense that in most organizations, they are going to be posting notices of where or don't enter notices. Mm. You understand? So if you look, for example, at our Public Health Act, our Public Health Act provides a lot of leverage to the Minister for um, Health to bring up and to roll up um, guidelines and uh, regulations when we are in, in, in times such as this. The most important has been the President's own endorsement of face mask. A national clarion call announced by the President in, uh, himself, who is Commander-in-Chief, that this country needs to wear face mask. In many other countries, about 40 jurisdictions, the wearing of face masks has been made either compulsory, encouraged, or advisory of some sort. Are, are we talking let, about let's, it let's, being let's, mandatory nationwide? Uh, we'll, we'll come to that, uh, and uh, I'll right. ask you to hold on to that for now. And uh, when we ask you about the, whether it's be, it will be mandatory nationwide, I'm sure we'll also add the fact that uh, will it be free or do people have to buy their own max and so on? But we have been joined by Professor Dr. Frimpong Manso of the Assemblies of God uh, to also shed more light on the three-day national prayer and fasting. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, a while ago, we spoke to Reverend Dr. Paul Boafold, presiding bishop of the Methodist Church. He told us about the three-day national prayer and fasting. But I asked him one question. Where was God? When all this was happening, and why are we going to him now? Why are we going to him now? Yes. You are saying, where, oh. uh, uh, yeah, where was he in the first place, and why are we now going to him when he watched on and he looked on when all this was happening? Yes, this is a philosophical question, which, when answering it in the simplest terms, is <laughs> not easy, but God has always been there. He knows whatever that will happen right from the beginning to the end. When was God when the Israelites went to Egypt? When was God when, when he allowed uh, Pharaoh to torture them? When was God when the First World War and especially the Second World War? Why did he allow millions of Jews to die? Where was God when we see earthquakes and uh, flood in other parts of the world? God is God of the heavens, but he's always with us. Sometimes he prevents certain things from happening. Sometimes he allows these things to happen, but he gives us the grace to go through. I remember Paul having a turn in the flesh, messing of Satan, tormenting him. Paul prayed three times that God would take this away. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. What about John the Baptist, one of the greatest preachers ever lived? He preached and preached. And while he was, Christ was also ministering, he was imprisoned. He didn't understand why Jesus would not come and liberate him. So in Matthew 11, he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, what is happening? I am in prison, and you do not care. Are you really the Christ? And Jesus said, go and tell John what you have come and seen. We do not understand God. Whether he allowed these things or he doesn't allow it, his love is seen, experienced, is felt, even as we go through. There are certain things we cannot explain. There are certain things we cannot answer, but it doesn't reduce God. It doesn't diminish him. It rather strengthens him. I think what is happening is drawing millions to God. Where was God? I like your question. When Joseph, having had a wonderful dreams, was betrayed by his brothers, thrown the sent into the prison. Where was God when Joseph went through all these things? But God worked in all these things to elevate Joseph. For me, what we are seeing, I am not seeing the present danger. I'm not seeing the present economic forum. I'm not seeing the present pain. 
what I'm seeing is that God is, is going to use all these things as a process, I mean, a process to bring something out good. So tomorrow, when you and I are alive, we can say, indeed, God is good. Uh, Professor, in, in the Lord's Prayer, one of the lines says, Thy will be done on earth. This is a prayer that Christendom says almost all the time, every day, 24 hours, uh, 24 hours, uh, 24, what was it, 24 hours in a day, and so on. Thy will be done. Is it God's will that COVID-19 attacks the world? You see, it is a plea. God's will is that all men will be saved. All men will come into the knowledge of Jesus. It is his will. God's will is that we will live in harmony. God, God never will that anyone will go to hell. But it is happening. God never will that men and men will sleep together, women and women will sleep together. It is happening. God's will is never that Boko Haram will arise and kill people. Earthquake and tremors. You know, God has a will. We plead. But he 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 go beyond certain terms. I mean, this is a big question. A young man get married, a young man get married, their will is that they will have children. To me, this is the will of God. But they pray and pray and pray and they never get children. A young boy has gone through school with certificates, good qualifications. God will is that this guy will get a job, but he has never got a job. Is, is it God will? So you are really taking us into a big realm. We do not know his ways. We cannot understand him. That is why we should humbly put ourselves to serve him. Job never knew that God permitted Satan to torment him. It was never God will for Satan to torment Job, but God permitted Satan to do uh, professor, uh, so uh, within the three days when we uh, go to pray, what should be the prayer points? What are the things we should be asking God to do for us? Excellent. I will come there. Let me add, say something quickly before I come there. Three days prayer and fasting. But we also know that some people will be physically weak, breastfeeding women, probably those who are not very well, people who have got ulcer and others. So if for some reason you cannot fast, you can still pray. Some people cannot pray on from dust, but they can pray. There are a few key areas that I want us to focus. First, praying for our president and his team that God will give them the boldness and the wisdom to direct us. Praying for the scientists, two areas. Those who are doing the research, even Britain has got a vaccine now, they are working on it. It's on trial stage. That God will help them. Even our own Gucci is now blazing the tree. So that God will help them to come out with something that can help us take us out of this. Praying for the doctors and the nurses, the frontliners, they are crying for PPEs. They, they, they get easily infected in other countries. People are dying that God will guide and protect them, keep them safe. Three, praying for those who are affected or infected with the coronavirus. When I saw those who are affected, some people have lost their husbands, children, relatives, so they are really bereaved. And we do need to pray that God will strengthen and encourage them. Those who are affected, all of us, our economy is going down. People are still sick or sick, but crying. Some of us have lost some of our liberties. Now we are all using nose masks, gloves, and the rest. Also, we pray for national economy, economies. United States, Ghana, Britain. You know, islands have broken down. Oil has now collapsed. Everything is on the downward trend. So we have to pray for protection and security that God will revamp our economies. Because the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that builds it. Unless the Lord watch over the city, the watchman wakes up but in vain. And finally, God can end this thing. It is his will 
to bring an end to this. So let us keep on crying and calling on him and ask, pleading for mercy, for forgiveness, for cleansing, and also to stop the, this thing that we are suffering. All right, uh, uh, Professor, just before you go, we have a minute for you to start the prayer right here on GBC News. Oh. <laughs> we are praying. Father, we have no other God than you. There is no deliverer. There is no healer. You are the only one whom we have come. This afternoon, we are pleading for mercy. We are pleading for grace. We are pleading for healing. Heal our land. Heal our nation. Father, we pray that you will touch our leaders. We pray that you will touch our lives, especially those who have been infected and are still on the sick bed, on ventilators, and the rest. Oh, that you will touch them and heal them. We are also praying for those who have been affected, especially for losing their loved ones. We pray for those who have been made orphans and widows and widowers because of this pandemic, that you will be at their side to touch them. Finally, we are praying for complete deliverance of our nation, Ghana, from this disaster, from this wicked virus from this destructive virus in the name of god the father god the son and god the holy spirit amen thank you very much amen uh professor Frimpon manso from the assemblies of god we are grateful to you and uh we'll be with you throughout the three days of national prayer and fasting and um we will we'll certainly get back to you after the the fasting to see how it all went down thank you very much Thank you, and God bless you. Amen. And wow. that was uh, Professor Dr. Frimpon Manso. Councils are looking at it. Okay. And in the most endemic areas, these uh, um, press releases have come out. I think that, how do you call it, if you look at the virus spread, it will not be, I mean, um, all this part, I mean, part of the country would have to be looking at this. Uh, because we actually travel in and out. People travel from Accra to the north, the north to the east, the east to the west, and things like that. So there, it will be to no purpose if it's only looked at in a very secluded or limited fashion. You asked a question also about the free issues. I think that some, some part of it is actually even going on right from day one. I mean, the security services, those are the front lines. It's been free. Nobody buys them. So the, the question that we are actually confronted with, the economic question we are confronted with as a country, rather looks at how we perhaps may be extended to the general populace, the number of organizations, a number of companies have even started donating it free to the public as we speak. I think that if the National Clarion Call comes from all of us, media, everybody for it, we will galvanize our energies to get to a point where every Ghanaian has it. As but these conversations haven't begun yet. I think they have begun. If you look at, how do you call it, the signals that came from the Council of State, which was published in the newspapers, mm. they had asked the president to consider a, 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 a extending it to them. Civil society groups, the Center for Strategic and Defense Studies, whose work you've shown I mean, in this afternoon or morning, I mean, also have made clarion calls. Some other groups have made, media men have made these uh, clarion calls. So I think that in, 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 on, on a sober reflection, as a country begins to look at ways that um, we can pull out of this as quickly as possible, some of these measures would, and would, would begin to, to take effect. And you must remember, we are the first country in Africa to lift a lockdown. We are the first country in Africa to do many things first time, to liberate ourselves first time from colonial rule. We are the first country to, 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 to do a, a number of first, 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 first things on, in, on the earth itself. Okay. So uh, I would say that the, it's, if we are looking mm -hmm. at something big as every Ghanaian, for example, wearing a face mask from the north to the south, mm -hmm. it is something that all of us Ghanaians, including our governments, our private organizations, our 
benevolent societies, I think it's something that we must support. Well, Mr. Dixon, you, uh, I'll come back to you because um, talking about lifting of the lockdown and being the first African country to do that, WHO has warned countries uh, not to rush into lifting the lockdowns in, in, and so on. We'll come to you for that. But we'll go over to Kenya right now where our colleague Catherine Kasavuli is standing by to give us an update of what's happening in Kenya. We know that aside of uh, COVID-19, Kenya was inundated uh, with attacks by locusts. And this morning, we are hearing that parts of Kenya uh, is under, quote-unquote, attack from bees. How true is this, uh, Catherine? Well, they are not bees. They are actually, uh, they're called the Nairobi fly, and uh, their biological name is Hydrus eximius beetle. It's actually a beetle family. Mm. And these are dangerous animals. They're very, very small. They're just one centimeter small or eight millimeter. But we have very serious uh, toxins. You know, first we had the locust invasion, and then, of course, there was heavy rain in that area. And that caused a lot of humidity in the area. So the toxic flies, which actually burrow under the ground, they live under the ground. They now just, you know, <laughs> emerged from nowhere and invaded uh, the, 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 the commercial center, the commercial town of Habarnet, which is in Baringo County, which is 400 kilometers north of Nairobi. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, that's bad enough. And uh, so far, what actions have the government taken in order to um, spray insecticides? But they were using insecticides, uh, uh, pyrethrum-based insecticides, which is a plant that we actually grow in Kenya. But these uh, little insects are resistant to the pyrethrum-based uh, insecticides. So right now, the, the town has, is under lockdown, actually, uh, permanently. Nobody is going to their business premises. Nobody is going to the bus park. Nobody is going to, uh, you know, the hospital that is within that vicinity because they really sting. You know, if you crush it on your skin, it releases a venom which scientists say is more deadly than a cobra's venom, and it burns the body and causes lacerations and swelling and blisters and leaves a permanent mark on the body. So people are really, really, really scared. Mm. So the town is completely under lockdown. Catherine, when we spoke to you the last time, uh, we asked a question about poor and vulnerable people. Uh, these were persons who, even though uh, had permission to move to shops to buy essential needs and so on, were still struggling. Now, in the face of this new attack from these flies, uh, these persons are under total lockdown. How are they being taken care of? Well, uh, we usually have some small, you know, in the villages. I think they're depending on that. And this is a farming county. So it's the bread basket of the nation, really. You know, it's in the Rift Valley, where most uh, big farms are. So those who cannot make it to the town center to either sell their livestock or, or sell their wares, you know, vegetables and, uh, you know, other things, uh, now just have to depend on their basic things that they have on the farm. Uh, uh, these flies, is, is there a new phenomenon in Kenya? Has it happened before? It has happened before. The very first time we saw it was during the El Nino in 1998. You know, when the heavy rains came, you know, flooding and everything, devastation was caused. This was in 1998 and in 2007. We actually experienced them, but in Nairobi, in the city, capital city, Nairobi, we did not experience them, you know, up country or any other town. And so how harmful is? Yes. How so harmful is are these uh, 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 flies? Uh, can you tell us on the human being to start with, but also on uh, food crops and so on? Well, on food crops, they really are not harmful. They are harmful on human beings, and they are not harmful as long as you do not crush them. Normally, people get irritated by a mosquito when it comes on your face and you slap it on your face. Mm. This is what normally happens when you slap or crush this animal on your, on your naked skin. It causes lacerations and seizures, and then little boils, and of course, uh, they become blisters eventually. And the skin doesn't really look very, very nice. And some of the scars are permanent. So people are being cautioned 
to be gentle with them, one, if they land on their naked skin, but uh, to just avoid the town center because they are crawling even on the road, on trees, everywhere. And they love the neon light and they love fluorescent light. So in the evening, that's when they are really flourishing. And this is a development story. We'll certainly get back to you when there are new developments. Uh, we've been speaking to Catherine Kasavuli. She's a journalist in Kenya. And Catherine has been telling us about the uh, invasion of uh, some particular flies in uh, parts of Kenya, uh, bringing life to a standstill in, in those parts of Kenya. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, yes, so um, yes. before we get back to That's issues right. in Ghana, I'm sure you, you will be interested in yeah, what's happening in Kenya as well. Absolutely. I mean, and, and the moment, I mean, the, the, the point of the matter is that this is something that actually has been raging for some time, particularly in East Africa mm -hmm. and um, in places like in Somalia, uh, Djibouti, and then, of course, in Kenya itself, I mean, the situation is quite a very, um, um, a, a very harsh one. I mean, if you see the streets of Cabinet, I mm. mean, like she was just showing to you, you know. So we have been monitoring. I mean, this is a time where one, one looks at issues to do with national security threats. One is forced to then consider at the primacy issues to do with biosecurity and infectious diseases and things like that. You would remember, for example, that in the past, I mean, our discussions about national security have taken other inflections. But this time round, the biggest threats that had you call it um, that worse than even uh, um, uh, any other attack that we can, I mean, it's a pandemic, the whole mm. world. It's a biosecurity issue that mm. we are confronted by. So nation states in Africa would have to rush up. There's a committee, for example, that I'm a member of. It's a committee for CBRN. CBRN is a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear programs kind of um, committee. And issues to do with chemical issues, biological matters, like what you're seeing, nuclear, like radiation issues that terrorists can use, you know, and are gaining currency. They are gaining currency in a manner that either to people who look at security studies, people who look at security threats, have not necessarily considered as a big forefront attack that the world would see. I mean, when we started a committee, for example, I mean, they, what is nuclear? What is Ghana's nuclear threat and things like that? What is the sub-regional threat? What is that? You know, but I, I went for a program, for example, in the African Union. And returning back, the data that I, I had seen over there was quite alarming. The biological issue that you were discussing, this is something that we have known. I mean, that is mm. happening in Okere in East Africa way back, you know, for some time. And it's something of interest to all people in security. Silicon, you yourself, when you got wind of the story, I, I, I know you were very worried well, about quite it. It's disheartening because um, mm. you can't be hit with coronavirus trying to handle it under uh, yeah, an economy handled. that has a challenged uh, healthcare system. Uh, a lot of people who mm. are struggling uh, against the economic hardships this brings. And then have low cost invasion in the first place mm -hmm. that comes to destroy crops. Uh, and, 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 and farmers yields. And then the next thing we hear, these Nairobi flies uh, also invading some parts of the country. But it's good to know that it's only in a certain portion of the town. But I hope that they'll be over this soon and, and actually find more effective ways of, of dealing with them. Because she did mention that the disinfection they were doing, uh, mm -hmm. the spraying they were doing was not quite effective for the flies. But I hope that they find a real solution mm -hmm. soon. I may want to add just that. I mean, Kenya, for example, mm. they have a very robust attitude with security. Mm. Kenya, I mean, I've visited Kenya a number of times on purposes to do with security, and they are quite very, very robust. So I, I, this is a setback, but I think that the Kenyan state will rise up to it. Mm. All right, let's return to uh, issues affecting Ghana. We will certainly get back to that developing story from Kenya uh, subsequently. Uh, but. On our own issues here in, in Ghana, we're talking about lockdown. And you said, uh, well, Ghana is the first to have done, uh, to have, uh, you know, lifted, lifted right. the, the lockdown. Uh, but the WHO had warned countries to desist from lifting the lockdown too early. Yeah, so that's, that's acknowledged. But the point of the matter is that the president said in his address to us that Ghana will be guided by the science and then also by other collateral facts which are necessary for us to have in contemplation. And so when you are guided by the science, I mean, for example, the sequencing of the virus, for example, in Ghana has taken place. The University of Ghana has come out, you know, certain sequencing. That gives us some mm. ability to understand the virus, its nature, how it would affect us. 
some projections have been made pursuant to those ones. Apart from that one too, I mean, he has been very clear that his decisions have been quite elastic. It has taken in on board other imperatives. So, for example, he takes in on board the um, epidemiological uh, factors that he should consider. It's an epidemic, a, a pandemic. He must look at all those things. There are economic imperatives also. It's disproportionate effects also on the lower segments of our society and therefore on compliance. And so it is that for people who, for example, must comply with certain directives, I mean, the, 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 the burden of the disease on them and the burden of the restrictions on them must all be weighed in. I mean, if you look, for example, as Accra, you have over about more than 80% 80, 80 of homes in Accra without toilets and things like that. One must weigh all those ones in your national response. Mm. He says that one government does not fit all. One government doesn't fit all. That's a precedent. Yeah. You know, so one must appreciate that there are certain informations that uh, various segments of the population might not necessarily have. But having them in a basket to consider, you understand, he will be able to make certain determinations that are right for us. I think that what we are seeing in Ghana is the easing of a lockdown, a removal of a lockdown, but not a relaxation at all in the issues of social distancing, face masking, testing, um, contact tracing. These are elemental parts of the, the same WHO guidelines to Ghana. And you can see that we have rushed up issues to do with how we enforce it. Your, your program today considers how we are going to put into effect mm. roll out programs to ensure that the social, social distancing issues work in the country. And I think that it will work. Normally, at the very beginning, it's a bit chaotic. People are settling. They don't know what to do. They are rushing and things like that. They, you, it cannot be that you would have impositions without education. No. Mm. You, they must move pari passu. They must but move let, let me tell you one of the concerns of many Ghanaians uh, throughout mm -hmm. the WhatsApp messages since we started giving them updates, and especially following the lifting of the lockdown, people have, and I thought those were very genuine concerns, that when Ghana's figure was in the 20s, the president said, look, let's lock down so we can be safe. Then the figures rose to about uh, 140, uh, 1,042. Then People thought, wow, this is huge. We even need more safety. Then the president says, you can now go back onto the streets. There's, well, th there's it, a, a contradiction you, there. You talked about, yeah. and this yeah. is just a follow-up, yeah. you okay. talked about a lot of issues coming to play uh, to come to this decision of lifting. Is right. this guided by more by the science, especially because we are dealing with none other than a pandemic? Okay. And so, like I said earlier on, the decision that he says he would make, as far as we, those of us in security who are into enforcement are concerned, are that the decisions are predicated both on science. They are predicated also on other collateral facts, which are imperatives for us to consider. For example, the issues to do with the economy itself. I heard a few, um, you asked questions about food and all those things. You need a nutritionally healthy people to withstand the onslaught of a disease. And so if it's quite clear to you that the mass of your people, for example, are facing, they are faced with another mortal attack on that particular front, one would be forced to consider how you ease certain things to allow them to be able to be alive. If they do, so, so there has been a tension between also a society where you have half and have not. So the haves have food. They are afraid of the coronavirus. The have not don't have the food. They are afraid of the hunger virus. And there's a huge tension. About 6.8 million Ghanaians, according to some data, you understand, they are, are not well resourced economically. Mm. This is a data far different from what pertains in Germany, from the United States, from Canada, and stuff like that. Other countries that you know. So we are forced to, I made mention, for example, if you look at homes in Ghana, you have about, in Accra alone, more than 80% of houses that don't have the proper toilet facilities and things like that. So that is a, a huge problem. If you mm. look at a place like Ashoman, for example, mm. lots of homes are there that have this dark, um, pot, um, what's it called? It, um, uh, Latrines? No, no, they've dug um, wells and mm. things mm. like that in a home to be able to provide for water mm. and then sanitary issues. So the country has problems that must be looked at holistically. So if one picks the epidemiological aspects of what you should do, you should also pick other aspects about what is constraining your, your whole your whole cycle. I don't I don't I, I do not think that it would be a very prudent 
for us to look at anything else and what the president, having the gamut of all these things before him, the decisions that he makes. I think that he, he made, and he said he's not making decisions lightly about this. Right. Mm. The question now becomes what happens as the figures rise? The figures, we've had an yeah, update yeah, so right, now. Updates right now. Uh, we have now 1,279 confirmed cases. Right. Uh, we have 10 deaths now, so an additional one person has unfortunately lost their lives to coronavirus. And 134 recoveries from the 120 mm. so there's been uh, an increase in the figures 120 uh, one, 1279 cases now confirmed mm. 10 deaths now 134 recoveries mm. well, what happens as the cases begin to rise and so as the cases begin to rise i mean and permit me to speak largely not from a health perspective alone but, yes but particularly from a security exactly yeah, right. yes yes uh -huh. so at least from the security perspective, we understand that the figures for all countries will rise. The, the, I mean, it's a general premise that an infectious disease, the nature of which we are dealing with, will rise. I mean, so for example, if you pick more examples, if you pick maybe the most elaborate ones, maybe things like Italy, um, Spain, Germany, and all those things, regardless of having the best systems Germany has, the figures would rise. Because of the nature of our, I mean, whether it's aerosol, whether it is by touch, whether and it's, it's mutating nature and things like that. So this is a disease we haven't seen, the world hasn't seen. It's a new novel uh, coronavirus. It's not like those other viruses, it's a, a novel one. That, whose trajectory is quite very, its cellular structure there has been studied. And so the issues about whether it was spike is a given. As for spike, every country will see a spike. I mean, the best country that was touted as a global model mm -hmm. was Singapore. But Singapore's figure rose. The whole of um, Italy was put under severe constraining lockdown. The figures rose in Wuhan. Put them under iron grid lockdown like the world has never known before. Mm. Over more than 30 million people. It rose. So it's not actually um, um, an automatic fact that by locking yourself, I mean, you can, you can imagine the burden of infections even in a house itself that has just one person. So by the time you leave the lockdown, what happens to those in the house? They understand. So there, there are novel issues that we are actually still, um, I think, getting to grips with. But, um, I think, yeah. but you asked a question. Mm. So what do we do? So from the security angle, a number of things. One, to enforce the social distancing. At least we do understand that by the very nature of the virus, a certain level of distance is required. A certain level of distance is minimally required. Two meters from each other. As I speak, as you speak, droplets are actually easing out. If, if you smell the inside of you, you will see, even the smell itself tells you that mm. a lot of you know, saliva and mm. things like that have. Now, all these things without a mask means that these things are being distributed to others on surfaces. And uh -huh. so it's, it's imperative. You're wearing of your mask, even if it's a cloth face mask. I protect you you protect me right and so that has been the mantra of places like Czechoslovakia Slovakia and places like um, and, 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 and and if you go to Morocco I mean they've, they've made it so here we are enforcing the social in Ghana the social distancing and we are doing it progressively and fast we have to let everyone understand mm -hmm. number two we are still not relaxed on the issues for the contact tracing the contact tracing is to identify people and pull them from the society it is a fact of yeah. epidemiological control that you must actually isolate those members who are most infectious and withdraw them or let them report so that you can deal with them in terms of treatment. And then we are also looking at, like I said, the face masking. It must be a fact of our cultural, um, our behavioral practice that if somebody comes to your house without wearing them, you politely advise them to put them on. If you bought a car, you put them on. The driver's mate should put on one. The president said the coconut seller must put on one. It is not for elite people to put on. It's something that doesn't discriminate about who you are. The masses of our people are using public transport. Everybody in the public transport must put on one. And the GPRTUs and the host, uh, must all encourage people to put on one. Now, there are segments of the population that will not put on one for one reason or the other. One lack of it. They don't have the money to procure it. Benevolent society, uh, humanitarian organizations can target these groups and donate to them. Um, uh, uh, let's again, still on security. Um, at what figure 
will the president then or some of you then begin to advise the president to look at another lockdown um, if we are in the thousands now when we get to two thousand three thousand five thousand so so I, I kind of sitting here really i don't think that type of um, particular um advisory is something that has been but things change very fast mm. and so i think that both at the level of the presidency the presidential advice on corona the ghana health service the uh, the, com the Operation COVID Safety Committee, which includes 24, all these organizations are rolled up in those organizations. So when we sit, we sit with the, the whole of Ghana that is actually fighting this disease. So I think that the, 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 as the disease shows different inflections to us, we will begin to rush up activities in terms of the type of reports and advisories that are given. But by, mind you, the president, as a president, you get a lot of different facets of imperative advice that you should look at uh, and 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 you are the one to take the final the buck stops with you so so far the decisions that have been made i mean for example as in quarantining uh, arriving passengers doing contact tracing and have yielded the best of results even though at the beginning the same president perhaps for example was criticized that why were we spending money on those things but it turned out that when we saw 153 people you know positive i mean the whole country realized that it was one of the best things that we did. True. Um, all right. So many of you who are watching and contributing. Hi, Moomin. Uh, good job you are doing. Please pass on the information. Wearing face masks should be made mandatory. Please watch the video and pass it on to the authorities. Most European countries are adhering to the advice. And uh, uh, you add that uh, these uh, face masks are also mm. free. And uh, you, 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 so um, Mr. Dixon here has called on the generality of Ghanaians to contribute mm. in making uh, the face masks available to each and every Ghanaian. Uh, hello there. Um, I think Mr. President did what Mr. President did was right. He should not listen to what people are saying. He lifted the lockdown and people are complaining. Those com people complaining, my question to them is this. Is it a must that you should go out if you don't like the lifting of the lockdown, then sit at home. People have necessary things to do, they go out to do. Social distance should be mandatory. Wearing official masks should be mandatory as well. Thank you very much. And please forgive me, I'm reading the messages just as they come in, and so you might find that uh, some uh, grammatical mm -hmm. errors in there, and uh, that, of course, is not my fault here because I'm reading on the spell mm -hmm. of the moment. The government isn't telling Ghanaians the truth over the issues of coronavirus. Their interest is more on the donation than keeping uh, keep coming into the COVID fund, not the virus. Ghanaians must uh, demand for accountability. Isn't it strange? Government agencies donating to government establishment, uh, to a government established COVID-19 fund instead of private entities. Corruption everywhere. Um, I, I will not ask you to respond to that. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, these are uh, these are just. Maybe you could pick this and, and yeah. let uh, the authorities know that these are the things that mm. some Ghanaians are thinking about. Um, uh, most doctors, scholars, media practitioners say we should follow three, we should follow the signs, but there is nothing in the above scientific findings or any other scientific findings that recommend lockdown or total lockdown. We all, including the doctors and the scholars, will agree and can attest that anger can kill. It can lead to starvation, which quickly transforms mankind behavior to uh, irritant, grief, and violence. I, you can send a message if you need to discuss. Okay, so you're asking me to get back to you if I need more clarification mm -hmm. on this. But basically, the point he's making is that uh, in as much as COVID-19 can kill, hunger can equally kill. And so there must be a balance between the two. Please, what I don't understand is why don't we have daily update of coronavirus in Ghana? For four days before you will hear something. So I want to ask how many days they used to test someone on corona from Eric Kojo Mafu Obuase. Indeed, for us here at GBC, we keep updating you on a daily basis, and uh, the figures do not come uh, four days apart. In fact, as and when, so yesterday we had a different figure. Today, we have just given you uh, new figures, and so, uh, and there is a website. What's the website again? Silicon? The Ghana Health Service website mm -hmm. slash COVID-19. Mm -hmm. when, when you go to the Ghana Health Service website, you definitely see that you're being redirected to. Yeah. You can just Hello. click on that and get authentic information. Sure. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, is it true that another lockdown is in the offing? 
Tell us so we can begin to buy. Uh, once you have a security uh, specialist there, he is not the security specialist. He's the advisor, legal advisor, the National Security Council secretariat to Mr. Uh, Bonsu Dixon. Uh, is there one in the offing? <laughs> <laughs> At appropriate time, I mean, we should all know this. <laughs> okay. May God continue to bless President Ekuvado as he paddles his, uh, this country from these stormy waters brought to us by coronavirus and the death venom, the scavengers in the form of the. Okay, so this is, mm. this is not an, a, a political platform. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot continue reading your message. You have uh, mm -hmm. some pol very serious political views there. I would like to take that out of the program at the moment. We're looking at COVID-19 mm -hmm. and what can be done to resolve the issue and not the, the politics of it. Please, I didn't get Mr. Bunsu. I didn't get Mr. Bunsu's response on who's suggesting... Okay, forgive me. I'm, I, please take your time and text me so mm -hmm. I can ask Mr. Bunsu your question. But uh, on, on who's suggesting of not lifting the ban? So I, I don't know what he means, but... Who, who? Okay, I, get, I think I get it. Yes. I mean, so, I mean, his indications are that, I mean, who, who, on whose advice did perhaps the president take this? And so we have answered this question a million times. Mm. That the president relies for advice on a variety of very important uh, people and committees and stuff like that. That's how it works in this country. And so the Operation COVID Safety Committee presents the president with advice. The health authorities also present him with advice. There are other, um, other special purpose vehicle advisors that the president also listens to. And then there are also other issues that perhaps, like I said, might not even be known to all of us. I mean, mm -hmm. as a president, there are a lot of information that comes both within the country, external to the country, and all those things. So he addresses the country. In the seventh address, his address and seventh address, he makes it very clear that the decisions that he makes are not lightly. In other words, they are decisions that are made on the basis of an evaluation of diverse, you know, he weighs many factors. So one, if you are bringing advice based on only security or based on only epidemiological aspects or based on only maybe nutrition, for example, you know, he must weigh all these ones and have a middle ground about them that helps the country. Uh, so, so I think what we have to do is uh, many of the messages coming in asking you direct questions and the clarifications. Uh, for those I cannot ask on air because of probably the security implications. Absolutely. All we'll do is we'll forward them to you be and then if you have answers to those ones you can then forward back to us yeah. and then we'll let the public know. So please keep your messages coming. Uh, the number is on your screen right now. We have um, uh, Mr. Ose Bonsu Dixon, Director Media and Communications at Operations COVID-19 Safety Committee but he's also Chief Legal Advisor National Security Council Secretariat. My colleague, uh, Selikem Akola Chafalu here with me. We'll be wrapping up in the next 10 minutes, uh, but Selikem, uh, we still have some unresolved issues in respect of um, the, the protocols um, after the lockdown. Um, well, our reporters have been to, especially the markets. I know mm. we've already spoken about some markets, but here in Accra, the Kaswan market, even the Nima market and the other places that our reporters have been to, clearly there are no provisions, official provisions of uh, Veronica Barkett's absent, people adhering to social distancing absent. Indeed, we spoke to the Guta president who says, well, uh, in reality, uh, social distancing at our marketplaces is practically impossible because the markets are designed in such a way that people are crammed together. Stores are Lim have limited spaces and are together lined up and so on. People come in crowds. There's no way you can implement social distancing at the markets. And then I say, then our markets have become potential areas for the contraction of um, coronavirus. I mean, it's obvious that um, the only way we can enforce social distancing is to have the authorities come in and ensure that it happens to have someone officially come and rearrange the stalls to guide that process, to have uh, some security around, ensuring that this is done or it becomes a new culture. Until that is done, people will just go about doing things the way they have always done. Um, we are guided by rules, but we are used to this narrative in Ghana that the laws don't work, the rules don't work. 
And so we are most likely to be indisciplined about the way we do our things. It's even on our roads, you see that, I mean, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing that will help is enforcement. You saw those uh, videos of people who had crossed the median instead of using mm -hmm. the, 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 the foot bridges and they were asked to sort of just keep going over as a form of punishment. Mm -hmm. Even in the full glare of the authority, security personnel, we still do these yeah. things. So we need to call on the authorities to come in and enforce social distancing because yeah. the risk is to everybody if it is not done. All right, Mr. So, Dixon. Uh, may, I ask, may, I ask, may I ask just one thing to right. what the uh, Silicon said? I think that she couldn't have nailed it better. Mm. That's fantastic. The point is that, you see, so we began, how do you call it, our fight with a legal instrument. So the legal instrument is in position the Imposition of Restrictions Act, Act 20, 2020, Act uh, 1012. So the point that we're dealing with is that this is a kind of environment in which a lot of impositions are going to be made. So the suggestion that he says that we cannot do this, we cannot do this, really, to be honest with you, in this epidemiological era, will not, will not work. We will impose it, if needs be. And the impositions have started. The point is that we must decongest the market. And so we must do so with a lot of hindsight to do with the economy, a lot of hindsight to do with behavioral, actual behavioral practice, cultural, sociological data that we have, and do it in a humanitarian manner. How, what, do you mind, what do I mean by humanitarian manner? So we can say, for example, that those who sell um, uh, foodstuffs come on Monday, but those who sell non-foodstuffs come on Tuesday, and those who sell Colory item, colory items come on Wednesday. That is a human face to decongestion. So you will not find, and apart from that, too, we're going to impose a bit of then the limitations in terms of how close you can be with the other. If there is a will, there is a way. And under the, the, the imposition of restrictions act operates under the presumption that if needs be, these things must be imposed. Under a state of emergency under Article 31 of the 1992 Constitution. It is clear that at certain point, certain limitations, at certain uh, ordinary ways of doing things that people are used, even freedoms, freedom to associate, can be imposed. If you go to other countries, more than two, in, in Australia, more than two people cannot stand somewhere, unless you are related. Mm. You can't stand in the streets and you are three and four and all those things. You can't, even if you are maintaining your social distance. So you should not aggregate as groups. In many other countries, for example, we have similar restrictions on markets, market redesign. So if you go to Myanmar, Myanmar today, the market, there's an imposition. You cannot, it's unlawful. You can't have, because by so doing, you are defeating our public health act. You are amending our law by sitting down together. You are amending the very law that, and you cannot do so because you are not a legislature. So the, 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 the rest of it is what Silicon just said. The state must come in and impose it. So if you are three here, we have to be two, mm. or if it needs to be, be one. That's yeah. all. all right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ose Bunsu Dixon, Director of Media and Communications uh, at the Operations COVID-19 Safety Committee, who is also Chief Legal Advisor, National Security Council Secretariat. Uh, we appreciate your time so very much. But we also spoke to Dr. Kofi Kuneda Perku, who is Commissioner in charge of Macroeconomic Policy with the ECOWAS. And then we spoke to Reverend Dr. Paul Boafo, Presiding Bishop Methodist Church, as well as Professor uh, from Pomans of the Assemblies of God in respect of the three-day national prayer and fasting. And um, of course, uh, we also went to Kenya to speak to our colleague uh, in Kenya concerning the flies that have invaded parts of that country uh, and adding to their woes uh, as they struggle to deal with COVID-19 as well. Uh, thank you very much for being a part of the show. The news comes up uh, in the next 30 minutes. Please don't go away. This is where to be for all the authentic news, authentic information devoid of any sensationalism. This is GBC News. My name is Abdulhai Moumin. Thank you very much, Alikem. Thank you, Mr. Deskin, for thank coming. You. We are grateful for your time. See you again. Thank you so much. We'll bring you some more. All right.
everyone is a potential victim. But the good news is that everyone is a potential solution. Sensitize the masses to sanitize. Keep a social distance and quarantine. Wash your hands, keep a distance from everyone. Report anything like a simple tool. Serious fever is a simple tool. Dry cough is a simple tool. Okay, Tamala is a simple tool. It's a ice and flu is a simple tool. I will move We move Everything. 